Matthew chapter 16. Hold your Bible up when you get there. I think everybody's there. Matthew chapter 16. All right, Matthew chapter 16. It begins with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees came with the Sadducees, or the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, tempting or testing or desired him, Jesus said he would show him a sign from heaven. Now, it's always interesting to me when the Pharisees and the Sadducees team up because they were enemies. It's like the, the, the Pharisees were the legalists of the day and the Sadducees were the, the liberals of the day. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in a, a resurrection. I mean, I don't know what they were. They were just a political front and under the guise of being a religious order. But... Uh, it was Machiavelli who said uh, that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And he went on to say, and the, uh, the friend of my enemy is my enemy. But there's a little bit of truth in that. The, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And to the Sadducees and the Pharisees, Jesus was their enemy. He was the, uh, the threat to their power. All this fame and all this popularity. So they've teamed up and they come together, laying a trap for Jesus and ask for him to show them a sign from heaven. Now, we've read 15 chapters of Matthew. <laughs> How many miracles has Jesus done? How many miracles has Jesus performed? And, and now they're still coming to him and says, if you're him, prove it with a sign. <laughs> so... I mean, they were probably there when he fed the 5,000 or when he fed the 4,000 or when he did healed the lepers and the lame, you know. So they're coming to him asking for another sign. And you get the feeling that it don't matter how many signs he did before them, they ain't going to believe because they've dug in. They've dug in with their unbelief. And, and Jesus knows that, verse 2. He says, he answered and said unto them, When it's evening, you say it'll be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it'll be foul weather today for the sky is red. No, I hear that still today. You do too, right? Red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky in the morning, sailor take warn. It's an old weather adage, and it's, there's, there's truth in it. And Jesus said you can discern the, the weather. <laughs> when it's red and lowering, it's going to take warn. Oh, you hypocrites, bottom of three. <clears throat> Which, by the way, these were the religious high muckety-mucks of the day, and Jesus just called them what? They're hypocrites. They're pretend actors. They're playing church. Oh, you hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but you can't discern the signs of the times. I try not to even watch any news anymore, and I just keep getting bombarded with stuff. It's like you can't get away from the news. It's just depressing, and I've just kind of thrown it up. But, uh, you know, I still had not got over when they had the egg roll here recently, the Easter egg thing, which ain't really even a Christian thing. But some of the kids had crosses on their eggs, and they made them take the crosses off. Wow. And then they declared March 31st Transgender Awareness Day, and I thought that's no accident that they replaced the celebration of the resurrection with the celebration of abomination. And then something else popped up, and I checked this out. I, you know, it's one of them Facebook things. But you know, Is it true or not? And it is true. And I'm talking about the signs of the time. We're just continuing to slide down that slippery slope in America, aren't we? That's just farther and farther away from the nation that we were. Y'all know about the quarters? Ever since they've been quarters up until 2022, George Washington always faced in God we trust. Mm -hmm. And in 2022, he's turned his back on in God we trust. No. The signs of the times, you know. But President Obama said this several presidencies ago, and when he said it, he was right. And I said he was right as soon as it came out of his mouth. I didn't like it, but he said... America is a post-Christian nation. And that's true. I don't like that. But if you think about it, what he also admitted is 
America used to be a Christian nation. And we have become a post-Christian nation. And I don't like it, but I don't have to join into it. You know, I mean, if I'm the last American Christian, I'll be the last American Christian. Anybody with me on that? You know, it, it, it don't matter what decision the rest of the world makes. I, I've decided to follow Jesus. And uh, I, I don't know when the Lord's coming back. I don't know when the end of the age is. He said nobody knows, not even the angels in heaven. Jesus didn't even know when he was on earth. He said only the Father knows that. But yet we do look around and say, well, I, I heard no preacher say this probably 20 years ago, and I said, boy, he's right. He said, if the Lord don't come back pretty soon, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's true, you know. <laughs> and he ain't going to do that. <laughs> but but he, told the Pharise- he told the religious people of his day, he said, you, you can't even discern the signs of the times, but you're all caught up in everything else. And the reason they couldn't is the same reason we can't today. Verse 4, he says, because it's a wicked and adulterous generation. And by adulterous generation, I think he meant they were unfaithful to God. They seek after a sign. And there'll be no sign given unto it but the sign. There'll be no sign but the sign. And the sign is the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he's already went over that, right? As Jonah was three days and three nights in the heart of the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In other words, he said the resurrection is going to be the sign when you, see, when you see the empty tomb, which is good news for believers, but it's bad news for unbelievers because the living Christ will judge the unbelievers. And when his disciples were come to the other side, verse 5, they had forgotten to take bread. And I read this today, and we just read this. Matthew you know, you, you get to, sometimes you have to put the Gospels together and the parallels to get all the stories, but Matthew recorded the feeding of the 5,000, then he recorded the feeding of the 7,000, and Jesus is going to mention both of them in this chapter tonight, but you, you, you read about them, and then the disciples are going somewhere, and they forget to take bread. <laughs> it just struck me as funny. I thought, has he enabled them now? <laughs> you know, the, we don't need to take no bread. He takes care of that. But they didn't bring anything to eat with them. So, uh, so Jesus said unto them, uh, verse 5, I'll read that again. When the disciples were come together on the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Verse 6, then Jesus said to them, take heed or be careful or beware of the, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, he's just been into it with them, right? And the disciples, they're thinking, "Uh uh-oh, he must be talking about us. We forgot to bring the bread. He's talking about leaven for the bread. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, is it because we've taken no bread? Which when Jesus perceived what they were talking about, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because you've brought no bread? Don't ye yet understand nor remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? That was 12 left over, by the way, I believe. Neither the seven loaves of the 4,000, how many baskets you took up? Seven, that's that one, wasn't there? Which I, I read something last week, and it was like, <laughs> sometimes you read commentaries, and you think, uh, these people write some of these commentaries are these little faith, little faith people, you know. <laughs> oh, ye of little faith. And, and they were talking about the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the seven. It was probably just one miracle, but uh, the gospel writers, you know, record it twice. What I'm put this. Down. Matthew puts both of them in there, and then in this chapter, Jesus mentions both of them. It's two different miracles. Twelve left over from the five and seven baskets left over from the seven. How is it that you don't understand that I spake to you not concerning bread, literal bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, you'll, you'll find this when Jesus is speaking. I think John brings it out more than any other gospel writer, that so many times Jesus would say something and would, people would take him very literally, but he was speaking, speaking about something spiritual that just kind of went over their heads. So this is one of those cases Matthew brings out in verse 12. Then they understood how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine, which is another word for the teaching, of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Which their teaching, it was like uh, 
their legalism bunch was wrong and their liberalism bunch was wrong. They both were missing the whole point of a relationship with trusting God and his word. Now, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea, new story, by the way, chapter 13, they're traveling, they're about as far away from Jerusalem as they get. They go to the headwaters of the Jordan River. Uh, they've been up uh, where the woman was a little farther north last chapter. The woman who, uh, the Gentile woman who uh, just wanted some bread from the tables that the puppies even eat. She was a Gentile and the Lord blessed her. So they've come back down to the headwaters of the Jordan River and the, the coast of the area, the region of Caesarea Philippi where they'd been built a big, giant temple for Philip, the Caesar. So when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, oh, I don't know why, Every, the first time I ever read this, I just got a picture of it. In my, you read the Bible, you know, and you're just, it's not words, you're, it's, you're putting the movie in your mind, you know. And I can just see a you know, hot, dusty day in Palestine there, and they've been walking for miles, and maybe they found a shade. I don't know. In my mind, they did, and they sit down on a rock there and rubbing their feet or something. They talk in a minute as they're taking a break, and Jesus just kind of small talks, as, uh, looks over to the disciples, says, who, do, who, who are people saying that I am? They've been out getting bread and getting the meat and stuff, and everybody's seeing them out and stuff. And so they're out among the crowds. So Jesus says, who, who are people saying that I am? Because he knows these big crowds are following him. He knows that he's famous. So who, whom do men, people, who do people say that I, the Son of Man, the Messiah, am? And they answered, verse 14, they said, well, well some, there's different, different versions of you out there, Jesus. said some people are saying, some say that you're, you're John the Baptist. That was going around, this superstition, because... Herod had his head cut off, remember? And he, even he bought into that one when Jesus was doing miracles and he heard about somebody, he said, it must be John come back from the dead. Mm -hmm. Kind of funny, he could believe in the resurrection of John. but <laughs> They had trouble believing in the resurrection. Some of them said, you must be John the Baptist. And, and they said, well, some of them are saying you're Elijah because they had read their Bible in the last Jewish text of Malachi, last chapter in our Bible, Old Testament, said uh, that before the Lord comes back, said... Uh, Elijah was going to come, and Jesus explained that to the disciples earlier. Remember, he says, if you can believe it, he did. He came, it was John the Baptist came back in the spirit of Elijah as a forerunner to the Lord, the Messiah. So some say it's a lie, and some, some said you're Jeremiah. And Thomas or somebody said, and, and I heard one of them saying they thought you was Ezekiel, or I thought you were one of the other prophets. Which is kind of interesting. He was famous, and all these miracles are going around, and Everybody know well, it's, it's kind of an honor if they don't know him as the Messiah, that they at least recognize him as somebody that they admired from their past nationality, one of our heroes of the past. But he turns to the disciples now, and he narrows it down. Not just who do they say that I am, but whom do you say that I am? Simon Peter, we knew that, didn't we? We knew who was going to answer. Simon Peter answered. Maybe speaking for the group, I hope, but he's at least speaking for himself. And he says, you're the Christ or the Messiah or the anointed one. You're him, the son of the living God. And Jesus came about as close to bragging on anybody as you'll find in the Bible here. It's almost like he jumped up and pat Peter on the back. <laughs> and he said, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, which means Simon Son of John, his Peter's daddy must have been named John. Simon bar Jonah for, now there's something in this too. He said, because you didn't figure that, I'm paraphrasing. He said, you didn't just figure that out on your own. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but my father, which is in heaven. And, and I really believe that when somebody really understands who Christ is, that a supernatural event has taken place. It's not just something you read and said, yeah, I believe that, that God revealed something. God did a work in your life when you figure out who Christ is. My Father, which is in heaven, revealed that to you, Peter, verse 18. And he goes on bragging on him. He says, I, I say unto thee that you're Peter. Remember, it used to be Simon. Jesus changed his name from Simon, which means volatile, to Peter, which means rock. Something steady, solid. You are this, but I'll make you that. 
And he plays upon the word rock. Peter literally just means the rock man. <laughs> You're Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. And what is this rock? Is a theological battleground. I believe it's the rock of his confession. That upon this confession that you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, that's what I'm going to build my church upon. My called out assembly. If you're a Christian, you're called out to be part of the local assembly. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I, I was reading this today and it kind of excited me. I, I never really thought of it this way, but it said the, the gates of hell not prevail against it. It means that uh, the, church is, the church should not see itself as on the defense from hell. The church is storming the gates of hell. When we proclaim the gospel, then we are on the offense, and hell's on the defense. <laughs> and I'll give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever that means, you can read all kinds of different things, but I know one thing, a key opens the door up. Preaching the gospel opens the door of heaven up. But every individual still got to make their own decision if they're going to step in or not. I'll give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And uh, I don't know what that means either. That's theological battleground too. But I know this, that my job as a preacher of the gospel is to declare God's will to the people. And where God's will comes from is in the pages of this book. And we have no authority to change anything in this book because that would be changing what God's revealed his will to us. We don't have that kind of authority. So then he charged his disciples that uh, don't go around telling everybody yet. It's not time. Now he's going to tell them later on, right? To go out and tell everybody, beginning at Judea and then out to Samaria, beginning at Jerusalem and then to Judea and Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. And Peter goes out and preaches that day and opens the door to heaven up and 3,000 people step in on the day of Pentecost. But for now, he says, don't go out and tell everybody that you figured this out. Let them come to it their own decision, I guess. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem. Now, from this point on, he's having to drill into their heads that the Messiah is not what most people in that day seemed to think the Messiah was going to be. Somebody's going to come in and lead a revolt and whoop the Romans. They should have known this because that's exactly what the Old Testament prophesied, that the Messiah was going to be a suffering servant and his kingdom was not going to be of this world. So he began from this point on, as he's, from this point on he's headed back to the cross in Jerusalem. And he's telling his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the religious people, the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and raised again the third day. He's got to do all those things to be fulfilling that he's the Messiah. He's got to suffer, he's got to be killed, and he's got to be resurrected. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Now, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> Peter's rebuking Jesus. <laughs> now, here's the irony. I, I like the way you, you get it in the story, too. I, I, I told you a minute ago, we started just a few verses ago with Jesus bragging on Peter. Blessed are you, Simon, son of John. <laughs> just a few. Peter got it all right. And then just a few verses later... Peter's got it all wrong. And the Lord's having to rebuke, rebuke him. It gets better. He's not just rebuking him. He calls him Satan. <laughs> Peter took him and began to rebuke him, verse 22, saying, Be it far from thee. That's Peter's way of saying like Paul says, God forbid. Be it far from thee, Lord. This will not be unto thee. We're not going to let that happen. He never did get that through his head even to the last night when he took that sword going to kill somebody to keep Jesus from going to the cross right but he turned the Lord did and turned to Peter verse 23 he said get thee behind me Satan now he was talking to Peter but I think the Lord saw that Satan was using Peter right here too you're an offense to me Peter 
For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. This is, this is the human condition sometimes. We need to be able to see things from God's perspective instead of from the human perspective all the time. And Peter was simply looking. Peter had his eyes on the wrong world too much. He was forgetting about the world to come. So then said Jesus unto his disciples, this is to teach all of them now, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now this probably ain't a real popular verse with some of them TV preachers that are making billions of dollars every year because they're inspirational pe preachers that want to teach you to just follow Jesus and you'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise and nothing will ever happen to you. God's just going to bless you, bless you, and bless you. Especially the more you sin, right? <laughs> but here's what Jesus says. Count the cost, because there is a cost to discipleship. And sometimes it's tough to be a follower of Jesus. It involves self-denial. And self-denial is simply saying, I'm not Lord of my life. Jesus, you are. But I wanted to do that Sunday morning. But you're Lord. I'm going to church. But Lord, Lord, I, I don't want to. The circus is in town. <laughs> but you're a Christian, the Lord says. And there's the dilemma, you know. Oh, I, my, my, my buddy's going fishing, you know. It's a big golf tournament Sunday morning. But the Lord says, but I'm Lord, you're not Lord. So sometimes it involves self-denial. And sometimes you have to take up your cross. Now that could be a metaphorical cross. But for some of these people he was speaking to that day, in the future it became a very literal cross that they were crucified upon too if you're going to follow me it involves denying yourself and taking up your cross and following me and rather following him right now to going to his death on Calvary for whosoever will save his life will lose it whoever for his will lose his life for my sake will find it this stamp Jesus is Lord over that or Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done, Lord. Now, I have noticed this, that the closer you walk with God, the more doing what you want to do is what he wanted you to do anyway. It's not as much that, it's like, it's easier that way in. <clears throat> Here's your memory verse. Everybody remember, remember this one. I'm going to start giving you memory verses. This is, everybody ought to know this verse. Probably you already do, but if you don't, just remember this one. For, for what's a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? There's nothing in this world. Warren Buffett's money, if you had it, ain't worth trading for your soul. There's nothing more valuable than your own soul. What would it profit if he gains the whole world? Well, it might be nice in this life, but there's eternity that makes this life a flash in the pan. Or what should a man give in exchange for his soul? That's why I've always thought, you talk about gamblers. The greatest gamblers are people that, that they, they know they ought to get right with God and they know they ought to get saved and they say, I'm going to do it later. You're gambling with your soul. And there's nothing more valuable than that. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels. He's coming again. He's either going to come back in the rapture or we'll meet him in death, but he's come. we're going to go out and meet him one way or the other one, ain't we? He's coming again with the glory of his angels, glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works. Verily, now verse 28 is an interesting verse. It makes it a little bit more difficult because the chapter divisions and the verses were put many years after the original writings were. And sometimes I think they put them in unfortunate places because especially if you read it and then you wait a week and you come back to it. 
but it was one flowing story. But it's an interesting verse. Of what Verily I say unto you, last verse, there'll be some standing here. That's those guys he was talking to at the time. There'll be some standing here which shall not taste of death. That means it won't die until something happens, until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, if that's talking about the rapture of the church, then they're long dead. But I believe you'll find in every gospel when this statement is made, the next passage following it is the same one that we're going to start on next week, and it's about the transfiguration, where Peter, James, and John, some of the ones that were standing there, got to go up on the high mountain and see the little preview or the microcosm of his coming again when Moses and Elijah was there and he was transfigured they saw his glory before them that's the only way it makes sense if he was talking about what they were about to see in the near future because they didn't see the second coming they ain't, still ain't here but that's that's where I, where I go with that let's pray together Lord we thank you for the word of God we'll pray our memory verse tonight Lord to help us always to remember what would a man profit if he gained the whole world and lost his eternal soul. In Christ's name we pray, amen.